What I want to say about science in these lectures is quite different. I want to try to convince you that science, like any other productive activity, like the state, like the family, like sport, is a social institution. And as such, it's completely integrated into and influenced by the rest of our social institutions. The problems that science deals with, the ideas that it uses in investigating those problems, even the so-called scientific results that come out of scientific investigation, are really all deeply influenced by predispositions that derive from the society in which we live. Scientists do not begin life, after all, as scientists. They begin as social beings, like everyone else, immersed in a family, a state, a productive structure, and they view nature through a lens that's been molded by their social experience. What else could they do? But even above that personal level of perception, science is molded by society because it's a human productive activity. It takes time. It takes money. Science uses commodities, and it produces commodities that are sold in the marketplace. People earn their living by it. I earn my living by it. And as a consequence, the dominant social and economic forces in society that control time and money determine to a large extent what science does and how it does it. But more than that, those people with access to power are able to appropriate from science ideas that are particularly suited to the maintenance and continued prosperity of existing social structures. I'm going to give many examples in my talks, but let me begin with one that's particularly prominent at the present. For some years now, women have been pressing a society dominated by men to give up that domination and to open all the avenues of power and control of their own lives to women. In an effort to legitimize the differential power of men in society, educational institutions controlled by men, like the one in which I work, and newspapers, magazines, radio, and TV that regularly report and popularize the claims of intellectuals have been producing all sorts of claims for the biological inferiority of women. It's instructive to see how one scientific claim follows another as different aspects of women's biology are said to be important. Sometimes it's claimed that women's bodies are simply too slight to carry out the heavy physical work of being, say, an electrician or a firefighter. Then it's said that women's hormones make them unreliable on a monthly basis. You wouldn't want a menstruating woman flying an airplane, would you? Most recently, we've heard that the structure of women's brains make them worse at mathematics and other serious cognitive work, although they're fine at intuition because they use the left halves of their brains, whereas men use the right cognitive halves. Finally, we've been told that women use both halves of their brains more than men do, so that women can't think about specialized things. Of course, all of these differences are said to be coded in our genes. So women do not have the genes for math, the genes for business, the genes for aggressiveness, the genes for all those things that are supposed to give power in society. Women are doomed by their genes to an inferior position. And no matter how well-intentioned we may be, we just have to face facts. Anatomy is destiny. So social institutions have an input into science, both in what's done and how it's thought about. And they take from science concepts and ideas which then support those institutions and make them seem legitimate and natural. It's this dual process that is meant when I say science is an ideology. Look, science serves two functions. First, it provides us with new ways of manipulating the material world. It produces a set of techniques, practices, inventions, by which new things are produced and by which the quality of our lives is changed. These are the aspects of science to which scientists appeal when they try to get money from governments or when they appear on the front pages of newspapers in their public relations pressures to support their continued prosperity. We read repeatedly about how science has discovered something. But more often than not, these announcements are hedged around with all sorts of qualifiers. Biologists discover evidence for genes that may one day lead to a possible cure for cancer. While their over-optimistic reports breed a certain cynicism, it's nevertheless true that scientists do actually change the way in which we confront the material world. The second function of science, which is sometimes independent and sometimes closely related to the first, is the function of explanation. Even if scientists are not actually changing the material mode of our existence, they're constantly explaining why things are the way they are. 
They're producing theories about the world. It's often said that those theories must be produced in order ultimately to change the world through practice. After all, uh, how can we cure cancer unless we understand what causes cancer? How can we increase our food production unless we understand the laws of genetics and plant and animal nutrition? Yet it's remarkable how much really important practical science has been quite independent of theory. In a later talk, I'm going to consider one of the most famous examples of scientific agricultural change, the introduction of hybrid corn all over the world. Hybrid corn is claimed to be one of the great triumphs of modern genetics in action in helping to feed people and increase their well-being. Yet as a matter of fact, the development of hybrid corn, and indeed almost all of plant and animal breeding, as it's actually practiced, has been carried out in a way that's completely independent of any scientific theory about how it ought to work. Indeed, a great deal of plant and animal breeding has been done in a way indistinguishable from the methods of past centuries before anyone had ever heard of genetics. The same is true for our attempts to cope with killers like cancer and heart disease. Most cures for cancer are either the surgical removal of the growing tumor or its destruction with powerful radiations or chemicals. Virtually none of this progress in cancer therapy has occurred through a deep understanding of the elementary processes of cell growth and development. Although nearly all of the cancer research, above the purely clinical level, is devoted precisely to that understanding. So, despite all the talk of scientific medicine, medicine remains essentially an empirical process in which people do what works. If we look at the actual accomplishments of science, it's not at all clear that a correct understanding of how the world works is basic to many successful manipulations of the world. But explanations of how the world really works serve another purpose, one in which has been a remarkable success, irrespective of the practical truth of scientific claims. That purpose is legitimating society as we know it. Irrespective of what your political view may be, everyone has to agree that we live in a world in which psychic and material welfare is very unevenly distributed. There are rich people and poor people. There are sick people and healthy people. People who have control over the conditions of their own lives, like professors who give lectures on the radio, and those who have their tasks assigned to them, who are overseen, who have little or no control over any psychic or material aspects of their own lives, like the janitor who's going to come in and sweep up the studio when we're finished here. There are rich countries and poor countries. Some races dominate others. Men and women have very unequal social and material power. Some kind of inequality of status, wealth, health, and power have been characteristic of every society about which we know. That means that in every society about which we know, there's some form of struggle going on between those who have and those who have not, between those with social power and those who are deprived of it. The uprisings of blacks in American cities in the 1960s and 1970s in which there was a vast destruction of property and what you might call a radical redistribution of consumer goods, and the armed struggle of Mohawk Indians in Canada to prevent the encroachment of commercial and state power on their lands, are only the most recent examples of a long history of violent confrontations between those with status, wealth, and power and those without it. Repeated peasant uprisings in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries resulted in the wholesale destruction of crops and buildings and the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. The deeds of peasant rebels like Pugachev and Stenkarazin in Eastern Europe live in song and story. It's obviously in the interest of those who have power in society to prevent such violent and destructive conflicts, even if, with the police power of the state, they're sure eventually to win. Repeatedly, as such struggles go on, there are created institutions whose function it is to forestall violent struggle by convincing people that the society in which they live is just and fair, or if it's not just and fair, that it's inevitable and it's quite useless to resort to violence. These are what we call institutions of social legitimation. They're just as much a part of the social struggle as the hayrick burnings and machine destructions of the Captain Swing riots in Britain in the 19th century that helped to populate Australia with their penal colonies. But they use very different weapons. They use ideological weapons. The battleground is now in people's heads. And if the battle is won on that ground, then the peace and tranquility of society are guaranteed. 
for almost the entire history of European society, since the empire of Charlemagne, the chief institution of social legitimation was the Christian church. It was by the grace of God that each person had his or her appointed place in society. Kings ruled Dei Gratia. Of course, occasionally divine grace could be conferred on a commoner who was ennobled, and grace could be removed. Grace was removed from King Charles I, as Cromwell noted, and the proof was Charles' severed head. Even the most revolutionary of religious leaders pressed the claims of legitimacy for the sake of order. Martin Luther, that great religious revolutionary, enjoined his flock to obey their lords. And in his famous sermon on marriage, he asserted that justice was made for the sake of peace and not peace for the sake of justice. Peace is the ultimate social good, and justice is important only if it subserves peace. So women, obey your husbands. Now, for an institution to serve the function of explaining the world so as to make it legitimate, that institution has to possess several features. First, the institution as a whole must appear to derive from sources outside of ordinary human struggle. It must not seem to be the creation of political, economic, or social forces, but it has to descend into society from some superhuman source. Second, the ideas, the pronouncements, the rules, the results of that institution's activity must have a validity and a transcendent truth that goes beyond any possibility of human compromise or human error. Its explanations and pronouncements must seem to be true in an absolute sense and to derive somehow from some absolute source. They must be true for all time and all place. And finally, the institution must have a certain mystical and veiled quality so that its innermost operation is not completely transparent to everyone, to the man on the street. It must have an esoteric language which needs to be explained to the ordinary person by those who are especially knowledgeable and who can intervene between everyday life and the mysterious sources of understanding and knowledge. Obviously, the Christian church, or indeed any revealed religion, fits these requirements perfectly. And so religion has been an ideal institution for legitimating society. But you know, this description also fits science and has made it possible for science to replace religion as the chief legitimating force in modern society. After all, science claims a method that's objective and non-political. It's true for all time. Scientists truly believe that except for the unwanted intrusions of ignorant politicians, science is above the social fray. My teacher, a famous scientist who was a refugee from the Bolshevik Revolution and who detested the Bolsheviks, devoted a lot of energy to pointing out the serious scientific errors that were being made in the Soviet Union in biology and in genetics as a consequence of the unorthodox biological doctrines of T.D. Lysenko. I once pointed out to him that following his own political convictions, he ought not to carry on that campaign against Lysenko. After all, he believed that sooner or later a global conflict would occur with the United States and the Soviet Union on opposite sides. And he also believed that Lysenko's false scientific doctrines were severely weakening Soviet agricultural production. So why did he not then simply remain quiet about Lysenko's errors, so that the Soviet Union would be weakened and compromised in the conflict that was to come? His answer was that his obligation to speak the truth about science was superior to all other obligations, and that a scientist must never allow a political consideration to prevent him from saying what he believes to be true. Not only the methods and institutions of science are said to be above ordinary human relations, but of course the product of science is claimed to be a kind of universal truth. The secrets of nature are unlocked. Once the truth about nature is revealed, then no one can fight it. One must accept the facts of life. When science speaks, let no dog bark. Finally, science speaks in mysterious words. No one except an expert can understand what scientists say and do. And we require the mediation of special people, science journalists, for example, or professors who speak on the radio, to explain the mysteries of science, because otherwise there's nothing but indecipherable formulas. Nor can one scientist understand the formulas of another scientist. Once, once or so, of course, despite its claims to be above society, science, like the church before it, is a supremely social institution. 
reflecting the dominant values and views of society at each historical epoch, as well as reinforcing them.